the living word of God is from the judges, chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. Judges chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of Chalot, and Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows gathering themselves about Jephthah. And they went, they went out with him. It came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. When the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our chief, that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of the Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? The elders, of, the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. Then Jephthah went with the, with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. This is the word of God. Amen. Hello, good afternoon. Okay. Did you guys have a good lunch? All right. I know you guys are full, but please don't fall asleep, okay? <laughs> Today we're going to be studying about Jephthah, the rejected judge. We just read from Judges chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Um, some of you may have heard of Jephthah. Some of you may not have heard of Jephthah. Jephthah is the eighth judge out of 12 judges, right? Remember, the period of the judges was a spiritually darkened era, right? It was a time when the Israelites conquered the land of Canaan. Now, they were settled there. But even though they had the land, the next generation after Joshua did not know God, did not know about God's works, so they did whatever they wanted. It was a time period where they just did whatever they thought was right. And it's sort of like today, the time that we're living in right now. Everybody does whatever they want. doesn't matter what God wants, I do what I want. And during that time period, God would discipline his people when they sinned by sending foreign countries to invade them and attack them and persecute them, right? And when that happens, it's painful. So what did the Israelites do? They repent, right? They return to God and repent. And God, being a merciful God, when, you, when they repent, what does he do? He hears their prayer. He sends a judge to save them. So this is the cycle that's going on in the book of Judges. And the cycle continues because after they get saved, they forget about their past sins and they commit the same sins over and over again. So we're studying uh, today about this, one of those judges named Jephthah. Like I said, he was the eighth judge um, who saved Israel. And the text that we read talks about who this guy was. It tells us his background. He was the son of a man named Gilead, but he was the son of a harlot, it says. So he was not the son of, I guess, Gilead's main wife, but he was the son of a harlot that Gilead had, you know, outside of his, you know, 
wedlock, I guess. So when, when the brothers all grew up, they drove Jephthah out. They said, you're not going to have an inheritance among our father's you know, land because you're the son of a harlot. So they drove him out. They kicked him out. They rejected him as a brother. That's Jephthah's story. But then when the Ammonites attacked Israel because the Israelites sinned, and Israel needed a savior, a leader, who did they turn to? They turned to Jephthah. They went to him and said, can you come help us? Can you lead us, fight for us, save us? And Jephthah said, well, you know, you just rejected me. You kicked me out. Now you want me to come back and fight for you? If I do and you guys win, are you going to kick me out again? So they said, no. If that happens, then we will take you as our chief and as our leader. So they agreed to this. So Jephthah agreed. He came and he saved Israel. And that's basically the story of Jephthah. So what can we learn from Jephthah's story? Well, the main theme of his story is rejection. Okay? Jephthah was a rejected judge. And one of the consequences of having true faith and standing on the side of truth nowadays will be that we may be rejected, that we may be marginalized and outcast. Because the world is so fallen that if you stand on the side of God, if you stand on the side of truth, and if you stand with true faith, the world will hate you and may even reject you. That's what the Bible is teaching us. And not just the Bible, if you look through history, this has happened all the time. I think I may have talked about this a long time ago, but, you know, in history, people like Copernicus, when they spoke the truth, they were rejected, right? When everybody believed that the earth was the center of the universe, this guy said, no, the sun is the center of the universe. And everybody said, oh, you're crazy. They rejected him. And then later, a guy named Galileo said the same thing. Hey, you know, that guy Copernicus, he was right. The sun is the center. They said, no, you're crazy too. They send him to jail. This happens all the time, right? Look at Noah. Noah said, oh, it's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. So he built an ark on top of a mountain. They said he was crazy. Everybody said he was crazy until it started to rain, right? And of course, Jesus was rejected by his people. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was rejected. So when you stand for the truth, you may receive rejection. Okay? So in life, where do you get your greatest joy out of? Usually, the greatest joy comes from other people, right? From our relationships. You know, if your parents, your children give you great joy, your friends or your loved ones, you know, the community of faith. So it's people, more than things. Material things can give you temporary joy, but it, it doesn't last. That's nothing. It's usually people who give you great joy, right? But on the flip side of that, it's usually people who give you the greatest pain as well. And when you get rejected by somebody that you trust or you love, that's really painful. And this is what happened to Jephthah. He was rejected by his own family, okay? So what does Jephthah's rejection teach us in a redemptive historical way? Many people of faith were rejected just like Jephthah. For example, King David was also rejected, right? When David killed Goliath, he was a teenager. Maybe like 17, 18. But he became a hero overnight because he killed this giant Goliath, right? He saved the nation. And because of that, what happened? King Saul got jealous of him. So he wanted to kill him. So David had to go on the run. He became a fugitive for 10 years. Starting from when he was 20 years old until he became king at age 30, for about 10 years, he had to be a fugitive from the king of Israel, King Saul. So he was rejected. 
and he went into hiding, into caves, into the wilderness. He went all over the place, right? So he was rejected. And of course, like I said before, our Lord Jesus was rejected as well. When Jesus came into this world, he said that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, right? And because of that, he was rejected. If you look in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, it describes his rejection like this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 says, For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. See? The builders rejected this choice stone that's talking about Jesus, and he became the cornerstone. But for those who don't believe in him, it became, he became a stumbling block. They all tripped over him, and they all fell. Jesus himself taught to his disciples, right? In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected by the elders, the priests, and the scribes, and I'm going to suffer at their hands, and I'm going to die. He predicted this, and he taught this many times during his public ministry to his disciples. In Luke chapter 17, verse 25, he says, But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Right? But first, Jesus is saying, talking about himself. He's saying, I have to be rejected by this generation first, and I have to suffer on the cross. And then, not only Jesus, but what did he say about his disciples in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19? He says to his disciples, you will be hated by the world because you were chosen by me, right? In John 15, verses 18 and 19, it says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. See? So what Jesus is basically telling his disciples is that you will be rejected by the world just like I was. You need to expect that. That's going to happen. Because this world is so fallen and all human beings are so depraved, and we're all sinners, that without the grace of God, we will tend to reject God, we will tend to reject His grace. And people will tend to reject those who stand on the side of God. So that's the lesson that Jephthah teaches us today. And then secondly, when they were rejected, what happened to these guys? Well, they basically left, you know, mainstream society and wandered around in wildernesses or whatever. And what happened after that? In today's text, it says that worthless men gathered around Jephthah. So he became a leader of worthless men. Okay. So because Jephthah was rejected, he, you know, he left his home and, you know, I don't know where he dwelt, somewhere where there were not much people on the margins of society, right? And then worthless fellows gathered around him. This seems to be a pattern, though. It's the same thing happened to David. When David was on the run, what happened? If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2, this is what it says. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt 
And everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. See, this is talking about David. When David was a fugitive, all the people who were distressed, who was in debt, who was discontented, basically all the people who were on the margins of society, who were rejected or who were outcasts, all gathered around David. And David became their captain. He had 400 men. And then if you read on later on, it grew to 600 men. He had an army of worthless men. <laughs> the word worthless here in Hebrew means, basically means empty. So it came to mean, when describing people, it came to mean people who were empty of use. So that means useless or worthless, right? That's, what, that's how mainstream society described these people. But if you really read the story carefully, you will realize that they're not bad people. They're not like thugs or, you know, criminals. These are just people who are on the fringes of society that society deemed, oh, you know, like that person is just kind of, you know, useless. They're, we don't really have a use for this person, right? So these are people who were rejected just like Jephthah. But they're not bad people. Because later what happened? When they asked Jeph Jephthah to become their leader, it was those guys that he fought with. These worthless men became Jephthah's comrades and soldiers who fought together to save their nation. And it was the same with King David, right? It was these guys who stuck with David until the end, until he became king who followed David faithfully. And of course, same thing happened to Jesus. Who did Jesus hang around? Who were Jesus' friends? The Bible says in Matthew 11, verse 19, it says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So Jesus was described as a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Why are tax collectors bad? It's because ta tax collectors are basically traitors. These were the people who were collecting tax from the Israelites to give to the Romans. And in the process, they would line their own pockets. So they got very rich. So they, these are traitors who sold out their nation to give tax to the Romans. And... On the process, they collect more than was needed, and they would become rich from that. So tax collector was this term that was the worst that anybody could tell, uh, call you, right? And here, the word sinners basically is talking about immoral women, like prostitutes. So basically, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and national traitors, okay? People who were on the fringe of society. People who were rejected by others. But it was these people who accepted Christ, who believed in him. Not the priests, not the, the religious leaders, not the scribes. It was these sinners and tax collectors who accepted Christ as the Son of God. So when, when we are rejected for doing God's work, when we are rejected for believing in God or standing on the side of the truth, don't despair. Why? Because according to the Bible, when that happens, same people, people who are in the same or similar situation as us will gather to us. That's what the Bible is teaching us. So remember the prophet Elijah? He thought he was all alone. He was really dejected. And he was praying to God. He said, God, I am all alone fighting against Ahab and Jezebel and the forces of evil or whatever, right? And what does God say? In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, this was God's answer, right? He says, I have left 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouth has not kissed him. So God is saying, you're not alone. There's 7,000 people who have not committed idolatry, who kept their faith. They're all spread about, but they're there. They're going to support you. 
So like Jephthah and David and Jesus, when they were rejected, others who were rejected by the world came to them and gathered around them. So what this world or what the people of this world may deem as being useless or worthless, God could take a hold of those people and use them for his mighty works. That's what the Bible teaches us. And that's what Jesus did, right? He chose disciples who are not like well-educated, who are, who are not fluent. These were mostly like fishermen, une uneducated people. But he used them to become his apostles who will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So whether it be our rejection or our shameful past or whatever it may be, don't worry about that because God could take that and turn it into something great. And God could use that for his mighty works. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses three and four. This verse tells us the reason why saints, believers, people who believe in God suffer. Okay, or one of the reasons why we suffer. So Second Corinthians chapter one, verses three and four says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with a comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what does this say? When we suffer, what does God do for us? God is the one who comforts us. When his children suffer, God comes to comfort us. And then he does that so that what? When others who suffer the same afflictions or similar afflictions that we have suffered, then we could comfort them with the kind of comfort that God has given to us. That's why he wants us to suffer or he lets us suffer. So that we could comfort others with the comforting that we have received from God. So Jephthah, all these people, worthless men, gathered around Jephthah because Jephthah understood their situation, because they have similar lives. All these people gathered around David because David would understand them and their problems. All these sinners came to Jesus because Jesus accepted them and understood them, right? So it's the same thing for us. When we could understand the problems of other people and when we could comfort them, then we could evangelize to them. They could come and be gathered around us. They could become God's children just like us. So eventually, after this, what happened? Jeph Jephthah the, became the leader and the savior of Israel. Okay. Jephthah became the leader and savior of Israel. This is what Judges chapter 11 verses 5 through 10 talks about, right? They came to him, asked him, hey, can you become our chief and our leader and save us? And Jephthah basically said, well, first you rejected me, now you want me back. So are you really going to take me as your leader? So they swore. They said, the Lord is witness between us, you will be our leader. So that's what happened. So the elders of Gilead accepted Jephthah as their leader, and Jephthah went and saved Israel. Remember what our senior pastor said, right? He said, there will come a time when the world will come running to the word of redemptive history. Right now, the world doesn't care about God's word, right? Oh, we don't need that, right? But then there will come a time where they will need it. Just like the elders of Gilead came groveling back to Jephthah, right? Somebody that they rejected, they came back to him, asked him to save them. Just like that, right now, the people of this world, they don't believe in God, they don't need God, they don't need Jesus, but there will come a time where they will need him, and they will come. They will want to hear God's word. 
And we will be in the situation to be able to provide that word for them, like Jephthah was. So this entire process of rejection is actually needed. It is a process of getting us trained for that day. For David, that time of refuge was a process of humbling him and training him to understand what the normal, regular, average people and people on the fringes of society were going through so that when he becomes king, he could understand what the people, how the people are living. That 10 years was a very important training time for him to become a great king. Jesus, before he started his public ministry, went into the wilderness for 40 days, and he fasted, and he was tempted by the devil, right? The basic content of the temptation was, if you're the son of God, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You have all these powers. Use that power for your own gain. Jesus rejected and won over all those temptations, right? He needed that so that when he actually goes out into the world and preaches as the Messiah, he could overcome those temptations. Those temptations will not hurt him anymore. Jesus' disciples for three years were sheltered by Jesus. They went around and he taught them the word. And then after those three years, Jesus died and resurrected, went, ascended to heaven, and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and filled them with the Holy Spirit. Then what did Jesus tell them to do? He told them to go out into the world, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. So first, there was a time of being with Jesus, separated from society, and then once they were fully trained, his apostles were sent back into the world to preach the gospel. So there's the initial rejection, isolation process. And then after that, return back to the world to bring the word of God, to become witnesses of Jesus Christ. The word witness in Greek is martus, which is where we get the word English word martyr from, right? You guys know what a martyr is, right? Martyr is somebody who dies for their faith. The root of that word comes from the Greek word for witness. So in other words, in order to become true, faithful witnesses of Christ, we need to become martyrs. We need to die a little. We need to give up something. We need to sacrifice in order to become true, faithful witnesses. Whether it be our egos or our pride or our reputation, or our self-esteem, whatever it may be, we need to sacrifice a little in order to become faithful witnesses. If you are to live a true life of faith, we have to witness about Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, we need to die a little. Okay? Die to the world, and die to sin, and die to the temptations. So in conclusion... Through Jephthah's life, we learned that if we hold to a true faith in Christ, we will face some rejection and opposition and even hatred in the world. But we must not fear that because Christ told us it's going to happen. We have to go through that. In John 16, verse 33, he said, These things I, I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Okay? This is Jesus speaking. You're going to have tribulation in the world, just like I did when I was here. But he's saying, I overcame the world, so if you believe in me, you will also overcome this world as well. So Jesus is telling us that he will be there with us when we are rejected or when we are ridiculed, when fingers are pointed at us. And not only that, as we learned, other people who are in similar situation as us will gather around us. And those are the ones who we want to minister to, who we want to comfort with the comforting that God has given to us through his word. Those are the ones, I believe, that will come to receive this word. Those are the ones that we need to evangelize to. So don't think, oh, that person's a loser I don't want to bring him to church. No, that's exactly why you need to bring them to church, right? 
If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 and 33, and verses 37 and 38, it talks about Jephthah and the other judges. It says that they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. We didn't suffer this much, right? So we need to take heart. We didn't suffer as much as these people. And what did God say about them? In verse 38, it says, These are men whom the world was not worthy. The world is not worthy of these people because they were great men of faith. So what God is asking us is to have this kind of faith, to be able to stand up for God and for his word and for the truth, even if that means to be rejected by the world. So I pray that all of us here will take courage in our hearts as Christ told us, and no matter what happens, do not compromise your faith. We must stand strong. And when we do, these people who are in similar situation will gather around us like they did around Jephthah and David and around Jesus. All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this blessed and holy Lord's Day that you have provided for us. We thank you that you have set us apart and enabled us to keep this Lord's Day by worshiping you in your house. Lord, as we have learned today, help us to be strong in our faith so that even if there are rejections and opposition and even hatred because of our faith, may we be able to stand strong and hold on to our faith as Jephthah did, as David did, and as our Lord Jesus did. And may we be able to overcome all of those oppositions with our faith so that we may be victorious in your word. We thank you so much for the blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for your comforting, which you have poured upon our hearts. Help us to now take that and to be able to comfort others around us who may be in similar situation, who may receive similar afflictions. May we be able to pray for them and comfort them with your word so that they may come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much. We give you all the glory and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.